I've noticed something about the way that we in the Fallout community seem to specifically remember certain things about the games more than other things about the games. And I think this is something that comes up from time to time when there's a new game release, when there's teaser trailers or say the Fallout TV show coming out soon and we're getting screenshots and clips of some of the things that we are going to get to experience very soon. An example of this is one of the complaints that some people often say about Bethesda's involvement in the Fallout series. They will claim things like Bethesda doesn't take the series serious enough. And they'll use examples of some of the funny things, some of the silliness that happens in the Bethesda games. And, and I, I include that just the modern games in general, everything from Fallout 3 to New Vegas to 4, even though New Vegas was Obsidian and uh, 76. And then, of course, the TV show. They complain that, well, the original games were more serious. These ones are silly. Wacky Wasteland in New Vegas is definitely an option for a reason, because if you want the real version of the game, you don't turn on Wacky Wasteland. There are things that happen in Fallout 3 or Fallout 4 or New Vegas that take the game in kind of this non-serious direction. Or the Fallout TV show has a Cyclops. That's a problem. And usually this critique revolves around this idea that the first two games were much more serious. They were much more grounded in a reality and in a setting that wouldn't have room for those kinds of things. Which is a strange critique, because Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 definitely have their own weird things in the games. And they grew over time. Fallout 1 had some weird stuff, had some silly things in it, and very specific references to pop culture movies and TV shows and books and things like that. But Fallout 2 has even more. The designers of those games did not take themselves overly serious. There were definitely serious moments and there were definitely very dark moments as well. But they balanced it with things that were kind of bonkers when you get to it or broke the fourth wall. So in today's episode, I'm going to detail a bunch of the different wacky things from Fallout 1 and 2 and make sure that everybody remembers where this series came from. So let's start with aliens. Everybody knows I love aliens in Fallout and aliens are absolutely on the wackier side of things. They look like these conventional B-movie aliens and they show up in Fallout 1. They show up in Fallout 2. You find broken down saucers, the alien spaceships, you find the alien blasters. Heck, even next to the saucer, you can find the bones of aliens who did not survive the crash. And what's so strange about the way these aliens look is that they look slightly different from the Zetans that we see in other places in the games. The Zetans tend to be tall. They still have these bulbous heads. They're kind of green, but... The aliens and the bodies of the aliens that you find, at least the bones, seem much shorter. They have very, very large heads and very, very small bodies, which is kind of wacky. There's, they're kind of funny little creatures. And sure, you could come across the scene and think, oh, well, this might be a dangerous thing. But for the most part, this is done kind of like a goof. This was an Easter egg. This was something that not every player came across in the game or games, I guess I should say. And you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe this isn't too weird if aliens are a, a real part of the series and they are a real danger to the people of the wasteland, then maybe coming across a crashed alien ship would be considered like a scary moment. Oh, maybe there's more of these lurking around or waiting to abduct me or something like that. But when you get close to the ship in Fallout 1, you can read the saucer and there's a message on the saucer. It says... Property of Area 51. Return if found. This is a joke. 
in the late 90s, this would have been a reference to something that was going around. People who were watching the X-Files were probably talking about Area 51 and this idea that, oh, there's this cover up and they're dismantling air alien vessels in order to turn them into, I don't know, supersonic jets and things that could avoid detection, all of that kind of stuff. And sure, maybe there's some truth still to that. We're still in the in the realm of like some people think that might be a real thing. But you have to believe that they wouldn't have actually printed on the ship that they were testing or whatever property of Area 51 return if found. And it's also a little bit odd that there are the bones of actual aliens next to that vessel. Did they take back their ship that the government had taken from them and crashed on the way out of there? I mean, what is going on? It, also, on top of this... Is Area 51 still functional post Great War, 100 years after the Great War during the events of Fallout 1? If this was a crashed vessel from, say, the 1940s, then chances are the bones wouldn't still be there. They would have decayed. They would have been picked up by animals. They may have been covered by the sands of the desert. There's all sorts of things that could explain why they wouldn't be there anymore. But yet you come across them and everything looks like it's a fresh crash site. So... What's going on with that? Well, I think the answer is that it's a joke. It's weird and it's funny on purpose. Another similar kind of thing that you can come across in Fallout 1 is a giant footprint, a three toed giant footprint of what looks like it could have been a dinosaur, a theropod, something like that. The character Tycho comments on the nature of this footprint when you discuss it and says, yeah, I'd stay the hell away from whatever made that. Seriously, I've never seen anything like that. I think our best option is to move on fast. And this footprint is gigantic. You as a character can stand within the footprint and you could fit probably a dozen of your friends all in that footprint as well. And so you might be wondering, was this done as a joke? Is this something that actually references something in Fallout 1? Well, according to Timothy Kane, this was part of an earlier idea about time traveling and dinosaurs and these kinds of things going on in post-apocalyptic America. But those things never really worked their way into the game by the time the game was released. And so this was something that was designed put in the game and wasn't removed. They just left it in on purpose because it created this moment of, oh my God, what is that? What is out there? And they never followed up on it. So it became kind of this wacky moment rather than a plot point. Another possible explanation for this is that it's a reference to a short film by Marv Newland called Bambi Meets Godzilla. And there's a very similar moment in that film. Either way, it's a wacky thing that stands out and is part of the first Fallout game. Now, as I discussed with uh, Stuart way back, this is like years ago in the first, the first year of this podcast, that there are a lot of movie references in the first and second Fallout games. And those would be other references to things that were kind of put in the game as, as a joke, as something people would recognize, not to be taken overly seriously. Some of those references were used for very specific plot points and very uh, grounded moments in the games, but others were just references. So go check that episode out uh, on the audio version of the podcast. If there's a video version that you're watching right now, there's over 200, almost 300 episodes on the audio version on Spotify and Apple and all of that. But here, let's move on with some Fallout 2 stuff. Did you know that Fallout 2 has a number of characters that talk that normally wouldn't be able to talk? This is one of those things that I think is super weird and weird in a way that is distinctly different and harder to believe than, say, a human being with one eye in the middle of his head rather than two. So in Fallout 2, there is a cave of rats that you can come across. They, This is a group of rats that have infested Klamath's Trapper Town, and they are, for the most part, mole rats, just like any other mole rats you would come across, until you meet two individuals King Raat, R A apostrophe A T, and Brain, his brother. Both of these mole rats 
can talk. Brain is the smart one. He talks better than his brother, but both of them have the function of human speech and speak English. Now, this is explained by saying that each of these rats have enlarged brain cases. They are bigger than the other rats, and so therefore their brains are larger, and they are, I guess, smarter and capable of speech. This must have been some sort of mutation. King is spelled K-E-E-N-G-R-A apostrophe A-T. King rat is what that's supposed to sound like, right? It's a, It's kind of a play on the spelling in order to show that this is... A creature that isn't as intelligent as most people, but is close. And Brain is the smart one of the two, and is a reference to Pinky and the Brain, because Brain is part of this duo that includes Zomac. Zomac is a ghoul, and is, I guess, the dumb one that Brain has go do things in order to take over the world, Pinky. Like that kind of thing. So this is like a double setup here. You've got two talking rats. That's weird. But then you have a reference to Pinky and the Brain, which, if you haven't watched, is from Animaniacs, which was a popular and hilarious cartoon series in the 90s and then was actually rebooted a few years back and is absolutely hilarious still today, even for adults. I found it very enjoyable. This is a wacky situation. And I'm not sure how you would justify this as being something to be taken overly seriously. Now, these aren't the only creatures that can talk that would be a surprise. Of course, there are the talking death claws. We've talked about them before. They are generally referred to as the intelligent death claws. These are death claws that were experimented on by the Enclave in 2235. That experimentation gave them intelligence and the ability to talk to individuals, to speak English. And the reason for this was because the Enclave wanted them to be instructable, to give them commands, to be able to talk with them about plans and have them follow through with these things, like, for example, storming Vault 13, kidnapping the population, eventually living with these people, and then the fallout from that, which I've talked about on previous episodes. But the idea here is that these are death claws that you could actually talk to. Some with an understanding similar to an eight-year-old human, but others more like an average adult. This higher level of intelligence even meant that socially among themselves, they functioned in a different kind of way. They had a hierarchy, but they were more peaceful and there was an ethical code that they followed. They acted more like a tribe of people than a pack of wild animals. And you might argue that these are an important part of the plot of Fallout 2. They play into the end part of the game significantly. And you would be right. That is true. But that doesn't mean that it's any less weird for a character that plays one of the scariest creatures you can come across in the first Fallout game to all of a sudden be able to have conversations with you. I mean, come on, that's just weird. It's, it's a weird development. This is one of those things that you have to imagine during the time where they were like coming up with different concepts for the way the game would play out and all of those things. Somebody pitches, hey, we should make some of these creatures talk. Okay, well, what kinds of things can we make talk? Well, you know, some of the rats can talk. Well, if the rats can talk, maybe the death claws can talk too. If it's some sort of mutation. Okay. Yeah, and then that could play into the whole story with the Enclave and the reason why they stormed the vault and all of that. Okay, that's great. So they, they're they smart, too. We've got just kind of general mutations that happen with certain types of creatures that you wouldn't expect that make them smart enough to talk. Yeah, we could do rats. We could do death claws. We could also do plants. Yes, plants. <laughs> there are talk. There's at least one talking plant in the game. You might have thought rats and death claws was pushing it. How about a talking spore plant? If you head over to Broken Hills, you can find a plot of land with a bunch of vegetation. It's like a little farm. And in that farm is Seymour, the talking plant. Now, clearly, this is another cultural reference. This is Little Shop of Horrors. The plant, the talking plant that wants to eat people is called Seymour in that as well. And was grown by a insane professor. 
He's quoted as saying, yes, I do talk better than some people, it seems. I'd smile at you right now, but I just don't have a mouth. And then it laughs. Now, of course, this plays into these side quests and isn't the only weird thing that this professor happens to have on the premises. There is a rad scorpion. Now, you might be thinking, oh, the rad scorpion talks as well. Not exactly. You see, this rad scorpion likes to play chess. Yep, chess. And there's even a challenge to defeat it playing chess in the game. This plays into the storyline with the professor. And by the way, he's just called the professor. That's all we know, professor. He's a crazy guy who has now somehow figured out how to make plants talk and make rad scorpions play games of chess. So from aliens to talking death claws and talking plants and chess playing rad scorpions, and of course, giant dinosaur footprints, there's a lot of wacky stuff in these games, but that's not all. There are moments in Fallout 2 especially that would feel more similar to watching Deadpool than watching a Fallout game because characters will break the fourth wall. This is something that they were doing in this game back in the late 90s. So they were a little ahead of the time, at least if you consider this trend in some of the Marvel stuff, Deadpool and She-Hulk. All right, so let's talk about breaking the fourth wall because that by definition seems to be a wacky thing to do. A lot of people would say you don't do that in a game or a show or a movie unless it's very intentional, unless it's a goof that plays into the greater benefit of the movie. In fact, actors often avoid even just looking at the camera because it takes the viewer out of the scene. We're supposed to feel like we're watching something unfold, but we're not actually there. As soon as a character breaks the fourth wall, it's like they know we're there. They know they're in a game or in a movie and that we're watching them. It creates a completely different dynamic. Yet, Fallout 2 does this a lot. A lot of the characters seem to be aware that they're in a video game, that they're specifically in Fallout 2, that they have references to future Fallout games, past Fallout games, that they are aware of the fact that this even looks like a game, that the over what the overlays look like, all of that stuff is referenced in Fallout 2. So talking creatures, giant footprints, aliens, chess playing rad scorpions, and self-aware characters in the game all existed in Fallout 1 and then especially in Fallout 2 before we got to any of the things that Bethesda did to update and change the world. So I guess this is all to say, the next time you come across something super weird and wacky in one of these games, remember that that's been there from the start. That is part of the DNA of a Fallout game. And if you come across something weird and wacky in the Fallout TV show, as strange as a talking plant or a chess playing rad scorpion or a fourth wall breaking character, be aware that those things already exist. And if it's not weirder than those things, then just sit back and enjoy the ride because this is what Fallout has been from the beginning. I hope you enjoyed that look back at some weird and wacky things from Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. I'll see you next time. To plug into everything else we're doing, check out robotsradio.net. Reach out to me on Twitter at robots underscore radio. Check out the Robots Radio Rocket Club, where you can join me and a bunch of our other creators creating your podcast, starting a new podcast, or helping your current podcast grow. There's more information about that on robotsradio.net as well. And you can always talk with us and the entire community, over 2,000 people on the Robots Radio Discord. Come join us. We'd love to chat with you. See you guys next time.